This question deals with both hydrostatics and hydrodynamics. To start with, we're talking about a freshwater dam which has a 4 cm diameter horizontal pipe running through it. There's my pipe running through the dam. There's the water on top of the dam. We're told that the pipe has a diameter of 4 cm and we're told that the depth of the pipe is at 6 meters below the waterline. Initially, the pipe is sealed by a plug. I'm not going to draw the plug in place in this diagram here, but what I will do is zoom in on the pipe and draw in my plug, and we're going to want to find the frictional force between the, pl the pipe wall and the plug that holds that in place. That's in part A. In part B, we're going to take the plug away, and then water is going to spill out of this uh, hole and we're going to ask to find how much water spills out. Part A is a hydrostatic problem because the water is not flowing. Part B is a hydrodynamic problem. So first of all, let's have a think about part A. How do we find the frictional force which is associated with the plug? So what we should do really is look at the forces which are acting on this plug because one of them will be the frictional force and then we can try and identify the other one. On one side of the plug, we have the force of the water which is going to exert on the plug. Now, that force from the water, we can write as the pressure of the water multiplied by the area of the plug. That's one pushing force which acts on that plug. Uh, there's another pushing force, and that is that this side of the plug is actually open to air. So there's another pushing force on this side pushing back. It's going to be smaller because it's going to be the pressure of atmosphere multiplied by the area of the plug. How, how do I know it's smaller? Well, I know that pressure increases with depth. Uh, the pressure at the top of the fluid here is atmosphere, therefore the pressure as we go deeper and deeper into the water must be greater than atmosphere. Since these areas are the same, that means that this force is going to be larger than this force here. If they were the only two forces which were acting, my plug would accelerate to the right, therefore there must be another force, that's the friction force. And so the sum of these three forces here must be zero in order for that plug not to accelerate, that's just Newton's second law. So why don't we start with that? We can write down Newton's second law, some of the forces have to equal zero. What we might do is take going to the right as being positive. So I can say that my force associated with the water is going to be the pressure of the water times the area of the plug, and that then has to add to the pressure of the air acting on the plug, so let's add to but because it's in the opposite direction it's now a negative pressure of the air is pressure at atmosphere times the area of the plug and then we have also the frictional force which is acting to the left and the sum of those forces has to equal zero. We want to find the magnitude of the frictional force which uh, just means we can make that equal to the subject so the frictional force is equal to the pressure of the water minus the pressure of atmosphere multiplied by the area. So the area is common, so I've factorised that out. So all we have to ask ourselves is what is the pressure of the water? We know that pressure increases with depth in an incompressible fluid. We can write this as P uh, is equal to, or the pressure at depth is equal to the pressure above the fluid plus rho times g times h. In my expression here, the pressure of the water is this uh, pressure at the depth, which is equal to the pressure above the fluid. That's the pressure of atmosphere. The P0 is actually the pressure of atmosphere. Adding in rho g h, the density of the water, times gravity, times the height. So this term here is equal to the pressure on the left-hand side of the plug. You need to subtract off the pressure of atmosphere on the right-hand side of the plug and multiply that by the area, the pressure of atmosphere, uh, drops out in this problem. In fact, this is just the gauge pressure that we're looking at. So let's put these numbers in. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, so 10 to the 3, times by 9.8 meters per second squared for gravity, times the height, which is 6 meters. Then we need to multiply it by the area. I need to make sure that my area is in meters squared as well. So the area of my pipe, which is a circle cross-section, is pi times the radius squared. The diameter is 4 centimetres, so the radius is 0 0.02 metres, so that's the same as 2 centimetres, squared, and that gives us 74 newtons as my frictional force. We can see if we can quickly check that. If I was to increase the depth, if I move my pipe uh, lower and lower, then what's going to happen is that uh, my uh, this term here will get larger and larger, so my frictional force will have to be bigger and bigger as the pressure increases. That seems to make sense. Part B, we want to find the amount of fluid which is leaving this hole. And so this is no longer a hydrostatic problem, it's a hydrodynamic problem. So there are two equations that we used in hydrodynamics, or two equations that uh, we know of. There's our continuity equation, so that is the 
the area at one point in the fluid times the velocity at one point in the fluid is always equal to the area times the velocity at another point in the fluid. So this is my, what I call my continuity equation. It's because my fluid is incompressible. So this here, an area times the velocity, is a volume flow rate. So in fact, uh, an area times the velocity is equal to uh, meters squared times meters per second, which is equal to meters cubed per second. And that there is a volume flow rate. So think of that as the rate of change of volume with time. This, in fact, would be something we would like to get. So we'd like to get a volume flow rate, because if we could multiply that by the time, we'd get a volume. The other equation that we had, and I'm going to scroll down to get a little bit more space here, is Bernoulli's equation. And so if we remember in Bernoulli's equation, the pressure at some point in the fluid plus the kinetic energy density, so half times rho times V squared. It's very easy to remember, because it's just like your kinetic energy, except rather than having mass here, you have density. And then we also have our potential energy density, which is rho times g times h. And that has to be a constant at every point inside the fluid. And so the way we can apply this is we can look at two points inside the fluid. Point one I'll look at is at the top of the fluid. And the second point I will take will be in the fluid as it's flowing outside the hole. Because we want to get the velocity of the fluid at this point here. So we'll choose that as point two. So now we have these two points in the fluid, what we can do is we can write down Bernoulli's expression for point one and equate that to Bernoulli's expression for point two. We don't have to know what this constant is. So at point one, the pressure at the top of the dam here is going to be atmospheric pressure. The kinetic energy density term is going to be a half times the density of the water multiplied by the velocity of the water squared. Ask ourselves, what's the velocity at the top of the dam? And here's where we have to make a really reasonable assumption. And the assumption is going to be is that this hole is rather small. The amount of fluid which is flowing out of this is going to be in total small compared to the total amount of fluid which is inside the dam. That is, I don't expect the height of the dam to drop at all during that three hours. So I'm going to assume that that velocity is very small. In fact, I'm going to set it to zero so that that term drops out. And my third term is the potential energy density. So for the potential energy density, we know that with potential energy, you can choose an arbitrary place to be zero. So I'm going to look at my diagram here, and I think a good place to set the zero of potential energy density will be at the height of the horizontal tube. So this is h is equal to zero. Therefore, my potential energy density will be given by the density of the water times gravity, in this case times height, h, which is six meters. We can equate that to Bernoulli's equation evaluated at point two. So we now have to ask ourselves, what's the pressure where the fluid is? So the fluid is coming out into a region where the pressure is also atmospheric pressure on the right hand side of the dam. It now is traveling with a velocity, that's the velocity we want to know, which is a half times rho times v squared. And the potential energy density, well, just as it's coming outside of that uh, hole, it's traveling horizontally, so we can say that h is still zero, so my potential energy density term goes to zero. So looking at this equation here, what I really want to find out is the velocity, so let's try and make that the subject of the equation. I notice that the pressure of atmosphere appears on both sides, so I can cancel that out. Density appears on both sides, so that cancels that out. So this is sort of independent of the density of the fluid. And we can make the velocity, the subject of the equation, multiply by 2, so 2 times g times h, and then we take the square root. And that might be familiar to you, the velocity of the water coming out here is the same velocity you'd get if an object was in free fall from that height. Well, that's the velocity. That's 2 times 9.8 times 6 metres, and take the square root, which gives us 10.8 metres per second. We weren't asked to find the velocity, we were asked to find the volume of water which exited the hole after three hours. How can we get the volume of water? Remember, if I've got the velocity from my continuity equation, if I multiply by the cross-sectional area, that gives me a volume flow rate. So, scroll down a bit more. My volume flow rate is equal to the cross-sectional area times the velocity. I know my cross-sectional area is pi times... 0 0.02, that's in 2 centimetres in metres all squared, that's the area, multiplied by 10.8, which is 0 
0.0136. And that will be meters cubed per second. It's a volume flow rate. I'm going to turn that into a volume. I just need to take that volume flow rate and multiply that by time. So 0 0.0136 meters per cube per second. Multiply by how many seconds? Well, it's 3 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. And that's 147 meters cubed of fluid. If we wanted to check this, uh, what could we do to increase the volume of fluid that was to exit? We could, of course, wait longer, so this, t this time was longer. Uh, what if we increased the aperture, if we made the area larger? If we made the area larger, then our volume flow rate would be larger, and that would cause more water to leave the dam. To test if you understand the concepts involved in hydrodynamic systems, I invite you to try problem 57 of chapter 15, and this will really help cement your understanding of Bernoulli's principle.